A lot of promising research is being conducted in ovarian cancer, and it's likely that the introduction of novel non-platinum-based chemotherapies and molecular-targeted therapies will have a major impact, especially in treating recurrent disease. Mike, what are the most promising emerging agents for the treatment of ovarian cancer? Well, Maura, I can think of at least four um, general class of, of uh, compounds which are interesting, both from a molecular standpoint and from early clinical trials. One would be the PARP inhibitors, which we, we'll talk about in a second. Um, they're particularly, uh, look like they're particularly valuable in patients with uh, BRCA1 and 2 mutated uh, tumors. The second class we've touched on a little bit, which is the antiangiogenic uh, agents. So there's no doubt that there's a signal, I think, in ovarian cancer that it's a tumor that's exclusively sensitive to antiangiogenic agents. And bevacizumab, of course, has been tested the most. But you should be aware that certainly TKIs like pazoponib and sidaronib have shown some interesting activity, I think, trading off uh, with a lot more toxicity, in my view. But nevertheless, um, uh, although the pisoponib trial was positive, it looks like the company's not going to develop that drug, but sidaronib is still um, uh, being considered uh, for further development. Uh, there are also interesting targets, other targets, um, like ANG2, um, which for which there's several uh, active agents and some uh, phase two and phase three data suggesting activity. Um, and then um, uh, Others in earlier development would be something like um, delta-like ligand-4, which is in the notch pathway. Uh, these are all uh, targets within um, the angiogenic field for which there are drugs in development, so we'd keep our eye on those. The third class is um, antibody drug conjugates. There are a number of very interesting proteins that sit on the surface of ovarian cancer cells and essentially nowhere else in the body which can be targeted by antibodies, and these antibodies are linked to very powerful chemotherapy agents. So a couple examples on this would be uh, an imaging uh, drug um, which targets the folate receptor. Now the folate receptor, I think, is a very uh, Im promising target, although the recent trial was negative. I think that was more of a problem of imaging and the particular conjugate they were using. Another example um, for the um, audience to keep in mind would be MUC16 uh, and also NAPI2B, which are, is a phosphotransferase that's on the surface of ovarian cancer cells. So all of these conjugates are into at least phase ones, if not phase twos. They have limited toxicity and are beginning to show some activity. And then the final group of uh, agents I would bring up, because it's certainly a hot topic, is immunotherapy. So PD-1 and PD-L1 are now going, entering into clinical trials in ovarian cancer. There's a lot of excitement. Work done from University of Pennsylvania, Bob's institution, showed that ovarian cancer uh, can be manipulated in a positive way by immunotherapeutic approaches. And so I think that's going to be quite exciting. So what about uh, PARP inhibitors? Well, PARP um, is um, PARP's an interesting story. As you know, the science on that dates back several years ago. It's a very elegant story coming out of labs, particularly in the UK, showing that the inhibition of PARP protein um, can inhibit the repair of single-stranded breaks, leading to double-stranded breaks, and double-stranded breaks are lethal if you don't have a functional BRCA1 and 2 uh, protein, hence synth synthetic lethality. That uh, laboratory observation was migrated into the clinic with really spectacular early results showing, um, I think, um, fairly high response rates in the 30 to 40 percent range in tumors that had mutated BRCA1 and 2, uh, even in the resistant setting, um, probably not in the refractory setting. The story, uh, some of the early trials were probably not designed um, completely correctly, and so a couple years ago, many of the companies began to back away from the development of these drugs, and we were all very disappointed with that. But just recently, over the last year or two, um, everybody's come back into the field, and now I believe there are uh, no less than five registration trials um, using Laparib, Rucaparib, Neraparib, and even Velaparib, which are the four PARPs that are furthest along. Uh, exploring them in mostly BRCA mutated um, uh, patient populations, though some of them are also looking at platinum sensitive. And they're looking at them both in treatment and in maintenance strategies. Is there any rhyme or reason for in combination with a cytotoxic agent or as single 
agent therapy? It's a great question. It's almost like a religious question because <laughs> there are believers and non-believers. So the non-believers will tell you that what PARP is really doing um, is in, impeding the repair of, of uh, breaks in the DNA, and that's what your cytotoxic is doing. And so um, it doesn't make a lot of sense adding them together. You're just going to get more toxicity uh, without the advantage. On the other hand, um, if you give a platinum and you cause single strand breaks and then you block the ability of the cell to repair itself, you may get some synergistic activity. I don't think we know the answer, Bob. Um, we do know they're not easy to combine. The one exception is Velaprib is probably the best. Um, there is a lot of myelosuppression when you combine the two. And then um, it's sort of hanging out in the background there is the issue of long-term toxicity. We're all a little worried about giving drugs that inhib inhibit DNA repair, particularly in combination with chemo, to ladies who then may live six, seven years. Are they going to show up with MDS or leukemia? So that, and that, in this particular this setting, that's a concern because we obviously had that experience uh, with the alkylating agents and radiation in the past. I, I think, to be fair, you'll need to discuss all of that with your patients, both short-term risk and long-term risk. Fair enough. Any other questions or comments? Obviously, there is some really exciting research ongoing, and we'll have to wait for the results. My quick question, do you have any thoughts on identifying a marker for bevacizumab specifically in women, like that kind of research? I have lots of thoughts, Warner. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so actually, that is probably the second holy grail other than the PARP inhibitor, which is if, um, if we have a PFS difference but not an OS difference, uh, could we identify a subset of patients who benefit the most? And that, of course, then might translate into an OS. I'm not even sure that's true. But I do suspect, and Bob may want to comment on this, that there are patients who, for whom Bev is better than other patients. And to date, um, other than the more recent presentation at ASCO by the, um, the, the Scottish group, it's been very difficult, even in other tumors, to identify either plasma-based markers or tumor-based markers to identify patients who are going to benefit the most from, from an agent like bevacizumab. The reason for that may simply be that angiogenesis is so complex that no single marker is going to do it. We're going to need to understand the process a little better. I don't have anything to add, but I think that your points are very well taken. I agree with them. What do you think about the ASCO presentation that suggested that they had identified a pattern that would separate patients into those that would and would not benefit. Yeah, so I had the pleasure of debating Charlie about four weeks ago over in uh, Frankfurt, um, and I saw the, that data, and then he presented additional data um, uh, that they've obtained since then. And, and so, uh, to be fair, because they're a very good group of scientists, um, I think we ought to just recognize that it's, it is based on a very small number of specimens. Uh, it's not been validated. Um, and, um, you know, it's a pretty complex bioinformatic analysis, and so it always worries me that when you need to do that to identify a subset of patients that you're going to get a false positive signal. So I don't believe it until we obtain independent validation, which, frankly, the GOG-218 specimens may be a good, good source.